Day, CIA, the Swiss Impact Investment Association. Uh, welcome to the people who are with us uh, in person and welcome to the people who are actually on Zoom. We're looking forward to our discussion. We're going to have an hour and a half of exchanges, so maybe some logistics at the beginning. So the people who are online, please don't hesitate to put your questions on the Q&A box and we will go through it actually as we go um, through the discussion. And for the people who are here with us, uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of uh, the discussion. So we have a really packed day. We have actually five to six actually people uh, intervention, and we're really looking forward to uh, this discussion. My name is Derek Dostock-Halper. I'm uh, on the advisory board of uh, CIA, and I'm also the founder of uh, the Impact and Think Tank Canalytics uh, organization. So uh, today we're going to look at real-life examples of actors who have been in the world of impact for the last 20 years, some of them. And of course, impact for us is really products and services who are on the ground making a difference to make the system more inclusive or sustainable on the environmental side. So we're going to speak today about products, services, solutions, and exchanges which are really linked to experiences, to really the human dimension and the solution themselves. So we were going to have someone who's been actually the seed investor of major impact initiatives over the last 20 years. Another person will share the DNA of his family, which is really long-term focused with a strong purpose dimension. Then we'll have actually an innovative approach where we'll have actually sustainability as a source of innovation. Then someone will really discuss actually her experience about preparing the future leaders of impact. And finally, we'll have someone who's financing on the ground SMEs who can really make a difference. So today, now I'm going to speak uh, and leave the floor to Ben, who's the president of uh, the Swiss Impact Investment Association. And he's going to share with us actually the story of SIA and actually then present every panelist. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, Derek for this kind invitation and introduction. Welcome everybody and thank you very much for making the 90 minutes time of your busy day, especially in the Wednesday morning, middle of the week. So I'll just start with a short introduction of SIA, what we are or who we are, which is more important. So we started in 2015. So we are six years ago we were founded. I myself was in the, busy in the sector of impact investment more than 20 years. We have been doing it quite, quite very well. Our main objective was to spread the awareness of impact investment in the Swiss financial sector. And the second objective was to make Switzerland the center of sustainability or impact investment here. So the first part, we succeeded very, very well. Now at I mean, everybody is today speaking of impact investment, so we are doing quite very well in the second. Today is our sixth annual event. So basically, we have an annual event every year. This is the first time we are out of Zoom because we always have been in Zoom and we do everything in Zoom. And today we are in Geneva. See, I can mention only three things. We are, to my knowledge, the oldest or among one of the oldest or the oldest organization in Switzerland busy on the topic of impact investment. We have been talking about this and working at it and we are completely active in this sector since quite a very long time. Second is we are pure players. So we really stick to impact investment as it is meant to be, as it is defined to be, which is still sometimes a question, but we do that. And we not only speak about it, we act on it. And I'll just tell you, very quickly, soon after this, how we are acting on it all around the world on this topic. And the last of all, thanks to our members and our partners, we are international. We are quoted from United Nations headquarter in Washington till the parliament in Australia. We are quoted by the indigenous communities in Americas, in Canada, we are quoted everywhere. So we are very international and very well known in that sector. So that's what we are. We, of course, we are founded in Zug. Most of us are in Zug. We have been very focused in Zug. And now we are also in Romandi. So Derek and Christian Kingongwe, who couldn't make it today because he's speaking somewhere else, is, are representing us in here in, in the Romandi part of Switzerland. 
So who are our partners? And, and uh, Carly Taylor, who was so gracious enough to invite us to participate in this event, she sent an email a few days back where she wrote, if you want to go fastest, you should go alone. But if you want to go far, you have to go as a team. And I really, really believe it. And especially in today's day, it's more valid than ever. Because we are talking about global issues, whether it is climate change, whether it is loss of biodiversity, whether it is social inequality. It's all is in the global change we are working. We have to work as a team. So we have very, very good partners. We have Canton Zoo. They have been with us from the day one that CIA was set up. They have supported us with everything. They are still there, and they will always be with the stronghold of SIA. And why? Because another point of Canton Zug is that Canton Zug itself has the policy in its uh, actions and activities where sustainability, thank you, <laughs> where sustainability and impact plays a very big role. And it is in the financial sector, in the real estate development, but a lot more. Second is chamomile. Chamomile, to my knowledge, by far is the biggest impact investment network in Switzerland. It's a platform that we are using at SIA. It has uh, financial institutions starting from the Norwegian Sovereign Fund to um, uh, the European Investment Bank and major institutions. Are there. Their major impact investors are on it, uh, projects, businesses. So that's the network we are using. Third is Faith Invest. That is really very important for us. Three years ago, the head of 12 religion, or religious organizations came to Zug, and they committed a part of their assets for impact investment. They are one of our biggest partners, and, and they are doing purely value-based investments. Then we have the school. From Impact Investment School, we are educating SMEs around the world. We started with Switzerland, then we went to the West Europe, Nordics. Now we are also educating in Americas, in uh, Far East, in Asia, in Africa, on how to implement or incorporate SDGs in your business processes or make a business out of, out of the SDGs. That's what we have been doing. And we have also been educating a lot of financial institutions on how to make uh, impact or sustainable portfolios. Last of all, of course, is the TV. It was started uh, a year ago. It also became very famous. The idea was to spread the idea of uh, impact investment around the world. Today, it's being watched by more than 200 million people uh, around the world, but always on the sector of impact investment. It's a weekly program. And what we focus on is the heads of the countries, heads of financial institutions, heads of businesses. They all come and speak about sustainability and impact. And there was a side effect to this TV. What we found out is that projects or businesses or funds who came on the TV, they got what they were looking for. Because apparently, the financial sector of, of uh, the dark region, the Nordic region, and the Benelux, they are watching this. So this is basically our partners. Who are the members of SIA? So we have basically five kind of members. One are, of course, uh, the institutional finances. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the, the sovereign funds, pension funds. Second kind of mem members we have are asset managers, wealth managers, and banks. Third kind of members we have are ultra high network individuals and old families. We have quite a lot of them. Fourth, of course, are businesses and private people who are doing something with impact investment or who wants to learn something about impact investment. And the fifth group, the most uh, which I already mentioned, is the Faith Invest, who are also our member. So these are the members we have. Now we are coming to as of today. I was supposed to spread, tell a short story. So we basically have a big juicy problem. Two years ago, I was attending a similar event. Or, or it was, no, I think it was nearly three years ago. A similar event where a head of an asset manager, management company from Zurich, came and gave an amazing speech about how he manages hundreds of millions as discretionary mandate. And he is busy converting his assets to impact investment. So slowly, part by part, he had a program of about a year or something that in one year he will convert. And he also showed, presented two projects. Then it turns out, and, and it really touched me, and it touched many of the people of our community. And especially three, four years ago, our community was very small. I, by community, I mean the impact investment community. But then it turns out, when we knew further, a couple of weeks further, that they, the projects they were showing or proposing, 
they themselves were not in that project. They had not invested in that project. But they were promoting that project to others to get new clients. And their own assets were 100% just in listed assets. They had nothing to do with impact investment. So basically, they were using this to get clients. And this is not a one-off case. This happens more often. Because why? Because in their case, particularly in their case, the, the chief investment officer had always been working for many decades on basically on listed assets, and he knew nothing better, and he didn't want to do something different. And like I again mentioned, it's not a one-time one case. So that's example. But if you go forward with it, everybody is talking about ESG rating. Everybody is talking about impact and investments. But, and, and certainly, everybody is also an expert. And that really is not correct, because the issue is, where we see is that we knew about the climate change from 1960s. Of a very, somebody I admire very much who also got the Nobel Prize for it, Dr. Pachori from IPCC. He was predicting climate change since 1960s. We knew about that our economical model is not sustainable from 1970s. We knew that our extractive industries are doing immense harm to the societies and to the environments. What did we do? We have been talking, we have been creating policies, we have been creating agreements, nothing has been happening. And that is where I'm saying that if people come and say we are the experts on impact investments or we know what it is, please go back five years, please go back 10 years, 15 years, where they were, what they have been doing. And this is also the issue where we have that we are creating a problem where the solution, if it is not regulated, if it is not controlled, this can get erupt faster and bigger because we are letting the, the, the players, the stakeholders, who are one of the reasons that we have these problems or who have supported the creation of this problem, they, if we let them go completely free, unregulated, I think we have an issue. So that is where uh, one of the issues I have. And second we have uh, thing is that because of these ratings and these uh, commitments and these funds being set up, what worries me is that there's a distraction of funds going from which should go to impact investment, to real projects. It's not going there, it's going to projects where it's not meant to be. So this, and that is why we come to the action that we have to come together and get together and work together to make the difference. And that is where I stand for that with SIA, we are working together to make a real positive difference on this. And we have, that is our goal and mission. We are going to make Switzerland the center of sustainable and impact investment. That is our goal, that is our mission, and for that we need all of you in supporters. Going forward with our speakers, so these are the speakers today. Like Derek mentioned, uh, Prince Michael will be speaking about his views on financial institutions and, and the, the impact and the sustainability side. Stephen, who is very experienced in impact investment, will be, he has been doing this since many, many years. He will be speaking about impact investment. We have two projects, that is from Karin and Francisca, who has been doing, working at this event, uh, at, the, at their businesses, which are completely impactful and sustainable. And last of all, Recho, who is running a fund, which is very successful, which is performing well, and since quite a long time, purely on the field of impact investment. So with this, I wanted to invite Stephen. Is Stephen already online? Yeah, Stephen. So, 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 so. Ah, ah, there, there is Stephen. <laughs> So, so Stephen, uh, I know for many years, Stephen Brennickmeyer, he is really a role model, and I think many of you may be knowing he's completely a sort of legend in the world of impact investment. And, and he, today, he's, he's speaking on behalf of, he's the founder of the Willows Investment Limited, and he's also the chairman of European Climate Foundation. So, uh, Stephen, welcome, and I hope you can hear us and see us. Yes, I can. Then I give the mic over to you, then you can take it over from here. Thank you, Ben, and uh, welcome everybody. I'm pleased to be part of this uh, amazing event. Uh, on, unfortunately, I'm not in Geneva, I'm in, in Southwest England, and um, see, I'm not traveling now because of all these new COVID activities. But I want to talk a little bit about my view in regards of impact investing that we have now in the next uh, I think in the next 10 years. 
I think that this year, 2021, is a tipping point, not just because of the COVID-19 pandemic, of the hashtag revolutions and the specter of climate change, but also due to a raft of demographic and techno technological, technological changes in developing markets that will reshape the world in the next decade. While the West ages, a surge of young people will be hitting the workforce in the developing world. These youths will be educated to a degree unprecedented in the history of their countries, especially young women. They will also be filling the world's urban centers, part of a shift from the countryside that has accelerated since the last century. At the same time, the ambitious SDGs created by the United Nations have a target date of 2030. Moreover, we need to halve greenhouse gas emissions by this point to avoid a two degree increase in global temperatures, which we have been discussing at the COP a couple of weeks ago. And that would be resulting in a climate catastrophe. So actually, we only have nine years left to ensure that this planet is a place where we are proud to let the new generation 230 inherit. I like to focus on three areas, which I think are important in impact investment. Technology, making the difference. Hundreds of millions of people will obtain connectivity for the first time over the next 10 years. Harnessing this will allow impactful business models to increase their outreach to the benefit of populations otherwise excluded from access to information, healthcare, education, finance, and other essential services. We also call this the new climate economy. So many aspects are being developed. And I think if we are serious about climate change and the climate cut catastrophe, it's going to be a technology game. And technology is there to solve problems and to come up with exciting new solutions. And I think for impact investors, this is a wonderful new area of engagement. The second area is creating opportunity. From gender equality to income, income equality, this is a global topic. Business models that provide access to services and jobs for women Young people and other excluded populations will dramatically boost emerging economies. This in turn will catalyze development and significantly improve quality of life across generations to come. And as last point, talking about sustainability. As urban, urban populations search, particularly in emerging markets, finding ways to live together sustainably are crucial investing in infrastructure and buildings that avoid emissions or transitioning to green vehicles that reduce pollution. These solutions can also generate millions of green jobs, limiting global warming and boosting economies at the same time is a win-win for the planet and for us. So again, here I see impact investing is very much at the core of these new developments. And I believe we are at a critical moment for our planet and for the global economy with the developing world at center stage. This is the moment to harness new technology and new business models to transform economies while providing sustainable solutions to the challenges of our time. Many of these business models have already only risen to prom prominence <laughs> but their influence over the next decade could be profound for all of us. Yet this is also true of the investment that they need to develop. With ethical and consumer choices more entwined than ever, the rise in sustainable investing means that impact investors are choosing to align their money with their beliefs. By continuing to do so, we can turn this decade from trauma to transformation. 
Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Do you, do you hear me? It's Derek. Uh, thank you so much for those uh, insights. I had just a quick question uh, to really make it actually uh, concrete. In the next five years, how do you see capital, technology, and maybe private and public actors working together to accelerate uh, impact on those outcomes you identified? If you could share maybe one or two perspective examples with us. Thank you. Can, can you repeat this? I didn't quite get it. Oh, sorry. Um, I was saying actually to accelerate the impact in the next five years, how will you combine capital, technology, public and private actors to actually accelerate uh, our solutions on the ground to go to clients and people using the solutions? I think you see a definite move in the financial sector into this field. And um, uh, just talking about the COP, we have been at the first week, we had very interesting discussions with the financial financial sectors, with Deutsche Bank, with Barclays, with ASSBCs. And these, these organizations are very engaged to get hold of these type of opportunities, which obviously, as I said, I, I think this is the new way of impact investment, and it's becoming a much larger part of the investment world. So I think there are definitely amazing opportunities. And uh, obviously, a company like Responsibility, based in Zurich, obviously, they're already showing us how they can do this to combine public finance with private finance and to really make a difference in, in regards of their own investment portfolio. Okay, so as um, Stephen is uh, online, we thought that maybe we open the floor for five minutes if you have any questions in the room. Okay, so I think, so maybe just a brief second question on my side. Um, the key challenge is really actually the innovation step of uh, new solutions and a lot of people speak about de-risking that step and I was wondering with your multiple hats um, could you maybe share maybe some new solutions to maybe help introduce some innovation that traditional market instruments funds would not be able to fund simply because it's perceived as being too risky someone in your position uh, with a network experience, maybe you could provide us some perspective as to maybe finding that bridge financing to a certain extent to accelerate innovation and let it emerge. Um, I'll give you one example, uh, which I find very fascinating. Also, if we look at our energy mix going forward, uh, fossil fuel will not be part of the energy mix. We, we're looking at renewable energies, which is obviously solar, wind, water, etc. But I think one area of technology that is not really talked about is nuclear. And I'm convinced that nuclear has to be part of the energy mix. And obviously there are already a lot of new technologies being developed. Rolls-Royce, as an example, in the UK, they're now testing nuclear, small nuclear power stations, which are based on the technology that is used in submarines. And so that you could actually create uh, nuclear, small local nuclear power stations, which can provide energy for a local or a regional community, rather than these big, massive machines that have been built in France and in Germany, et cetera, and in the UK. So I think there's a new technology out there. Also, Canadian scientists have figured out how you can actually reuse a nuclear waste because nuclear waste has a lot of energy in it. And they find out that actually you can actually re reuse that energy. So you're talking here about a circular economy and uh, obviously finance will be there for these type of activities because you see, for instance, uh, fossil fuel companies will find it very difficult to get finance going forward because HSBC, Barclays and others have said we will stop funding fossil fuel companies. So I think uh, that capital will then move into new areas like, for instance, the new, new generation of nuclear technology. I think that is a very exciting new development. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, if there's no questions from the, oh, there is a question. Just a moment. Stephen, there's just one more question from the audience. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Uh, good morning. Uh, it's a question with regard to um, new business models. Often new business models are what is required to be um, demonstrated before pure play private capital can come in to, uh, to invest. Um, the problem is that the, those donors and potential investors who are willing to test those business models and demonstrate them, often with demonstration projects or others, are either very slow when it comes from the uh, public sector and too few. Uh, and um, do you think that there's more of a role for philanthropy in that space in order to meet the urgency with which we need to uh, address a lot of these issues that are on the table? I think philanthropy has a very important role to play here. Obviously, we're working closely with the Earth Fund, which is obviously the $10 billion fund that was uh, set up by Jeff Bezos. And obviously, they use their funds partly as investment opportunities, but also partly as, uh, as grants. For instance, uh, one of the organizations I'm working with, the World Resource Institute, based in DC, they got a $100 million grant from the Bezos Fund to electrify all school buses in the US. And uh, I think that is something that you that you do as partly as a philanthropic uh, investment, but also with a, a proper investment, because obviously that is now a, a public-private private partnership that has been created in the US to, to electrify these, these buses, school buses. And, uh, and I think that is a good example how you can use philanthropic means to, let's say, generate some new investment opportunities. And uh, but okay, uh, people with, with a vision like Jeff Bezos, they can do that. But obviously, other other philanthropic organizations are also looking at these these examples, and I think they're going to follow suit. Stephen, thank you so very much. And I, I don't know if you will be able to join us back in the QA session uh, because Stephen is having some work done. But in case if you can't <laughs> join us, then thank you very, very much. And if you can join us, then you're most welcome. The link okay. will be open for you. Yeah. Very and good. Then, thank you. Thank you. And, and with this, I invite another guest from us who came from all the way from Liechtenstein, started extremely early morning. So with this, I welcome Prince Michael from Liechtenstein. Uh, he's the chairman of Liechtenstein Finance, chairman of Industry Finance and Conto, and founder and chairman of the Geopolitical Intelligence Services. So Michael, welcome with this. And today he will be speaking as, as just as Prince Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Good, I, I, I normally do that, that I'm just uh, speaking of myself because I don't like to be bound by anybody or any organization when, when, when I speak. And I think this allows me also to be a, a bit more independent and sometimes also a bit more provocative, which I, I will start with one thing. And well, coming back to it, just don't worry, um, don't be astonished. There are certain points where Ben and myself have disputes since a long time, and it's going mostly on the role of private business and NGOs, supranational organizations, and government. I don't believe very much in them, the latter ones. But uh, anyway, let's uh, shortly go that actually I have a bit of a privilege to come out of a family who had always a, an entrepreneurial role and a role of responsibility. Because you know, an entrepreneur and also the questions of impact of sustainability is a, mainly a question of responsibility and, and long-term thinking. And, and if you do have a long-term thinking, you will normally make uh, investments which have an impact. Because only investments which have an impact are long-term good investments. This goes together and is also an entrepreneurial um, uh, philosophy. And I remember, and there's the first point where I disagreed with Ben when he went, uh, he wanted to put everybody in jail and keep them responsible and accountable for, for everything. Impact investment and sustainability is nothing new. I know already 40 years ago, entrepreneurs and also companies where I was involved, we were always thinking of all the stakeholders of everything around, so not on a short term, but a, but a, a long term survival. And that included that they always had some sort of circular economy because it was clear 
Every emission going out of the chimney is a loss. Everything you have to throw away is, 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 is a loss. So the entrepreneurial sector, the business sector, was always pretty strong in that, and that mostly the private family businesses. And this was always also a role in my family uh, since a long time, self-sufficient, having, uh, going around, we were very much also in forestry, replanting, redoing, having the, the, the right tree mix, but also having uh, loyal employees, so and loyalty is a, is a two-way road. It's not just just uh, just a, a one-way road. Work well, let's say, with the whole ecosystem around the people, uh, etc. So this was a, a, a long-term uh, principle in the uh, in, in the family, and this is uh, continued. And if you see now, for instance. Uh, LGT, which belongs to the, uh, to the Prince of Liechtenstein, they are one of the leaders in impact investments. Uh, but it goes also to the whole uh, country, and there I have a certain responsibility in the, fi in the, in the, in the financial sector. The, all the banks have gone already the way in uh, doing a sort of um, going to net zero on, 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 on the climate, doing the, 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 doing the right investments. But we have to know we need also to do certain investments which are not considered in this group as impact investments. Not damaging ones, but you still have to build normal houses in Europe. You have to do certain things in Europe. So don't, uh, don't forget that and let them more than giving big regulations, etc., let the market see what it is. And I think Stephen Brenningmeyer very clearly set the big trends. And if you let the markets go and you don't regulate too much, <laughs> then I, I think it will go in the right thing. Because you know the technocrats, they don't necessarily have the last wisdom. And if you get then too much money into a certain sector, it's been, I'm s pretty certain that a good part of the sort of green economy of Europe and this money which is uh, brought to, together by the European Commission on that will be uh, blown through the chimney. But we are working in, in Liechtenstein on that and I think what the banks do in Liechtenstein, this is really looking when they call it impact investment, it is impact investment, when they call it sustainable, it, it is sustainable. There's always a margin so the, a margin of error, also a margin of interpretation. But this, uh, I think uh, there we are in, in Liechtenstein, very much uh, advanced and aware. We also have in Liechtenstein a big culture since about 100 years to have a sector which is, works with these uh, issues of family and philanthropic uh, foundations and trusts. And this is wealth preservation. And wealth preservation means to use the capitals and the wealth over generations in a responsible way. For me, how, how I'm doing in time? Two minutes I'm left. Okay. Uh, maybe to me, and then I'm, uh, so I'm working in, in this sector, and it's important the responsibility. If you feel responsible, you, you will probably do the right, and that's very important, and that's also a sign for property rights and long-term property rights. And I think there are also interventions in that are dangerous. But, but there, there, there are other things, um, regulations. I'm coming back to that. I'm just in, the, in, in a project on preventive health. With most modern technology uh, trying to establish the status of health and than to help people to stay more healthier, which is very important in an aging population as we have in Europe. It's not a one of these mainstream, but it's also a mainstream. People have to, to keep healthier because our society will not be able anymore to bear the healthcare costs and the retirement uh, charges of this law. Now, what happened? In certain European countries, we can't do it. We simply can't do it because of, re of, of regulations. We had just the case where we wanted to do it, and 
it's a medical application also. It's a medical application, but, but, but for healthy people to prevent health. Now, medical applications in certain countries must have sick people. So if you don't have a program to treat sick people and to have beds for sick people if, if they have it, you're not allowed to do it. So we, we, we can't go with these with this projects, which are quite successful already in two countries, in quite a number of countries. So I think sometimes these interventions by regulations, etc., are very detrimental. And so I'm actually making a case for entrepreneurship there, going into this sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, um, I have a, a quick question because you have a unique position having actually two to three hats, because on one side, you have actually the state, on the other side, the, the private sector, and then, of course, the financial sector. And I was wondering, are you using that platform to maybe convince other states or stakeholders to maybe go in the direction they describe to us? And then maybe, as a second point, if you could maybe share one or two concrete examples for, for, for us. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's say I have very, uh, fortunately very little to do with the state. This is good. But in this hat, I'm a sort of the president of the organization which should do the communication for the financial place of, of Liechtenstein, which is a public-private partnership. So, so, so there I'm working partially with, uh, with the state, but mostly with the associations of this. And actually, our idea is very much also to get out this... Um, message that we are a sustainable place, that, uh, that we are a place with, with impact, we are a place of, 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 of philanthropy. And uh, Liechtenstein has proven also that it is in the comparison of the financial places, those who participated in this, which are most Europeans and other ones, the US didn't participate in that, <laughs> but uh, that we are in an extremely uh, uh, good position. It's clear in a small country, one, can, one is more flexible, and, it's a very, and, and Liechtenstein is a very entrepreneurial country. So this was gone through. The, um, the, the banks, basically all the banks, they, they have uh, committed to the different standards, uh, etc. Et um, I think... Um, for e examples, for instance, if you look what uh, LGT has a, uh, has a real sector for philanthropic and, and, and impact investment, which is an extremely good example, and this is actually the proper money of the owner of LGT, of, 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 our, of, our, of our ruling prince, but also of clients who are, who, are, who are joining in there. This is a system which, which works very well, and it did already impact investments before the whole mainstream uh, uh, run on it. And I think this is a, quite a, um, an important achievement, and they work in different countries, but they work very focused. I think it's very powerful because you're walking the talk to a certain extent and you have this really long-term purposeful approach to investment which I think is really transpiring into what actually impact actors try to do in our day-to-day -day lives. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think I'll keep my questions for the, <laughs> for the Q&A because okay. our discussion will go on. But thank you so very much, Michael. Please. Um, with this, I invite our... <laughs> With this, I invite Francesca, who came all the way from Sweden. Uh, she's running an amazing business, a company which is environmental friendly, and she can tell you all about it, who, how her business is, what her business is doing, and what we can do to also support businesses like this. And this is a concrete case of impact investment. Thank Welcome. You so much, ben. Yes, hello everyone. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be with all of you here today. And as we all come together in this beautiful city of Geneva and to really discuss how we can change the economic system to one that regenerates our planet, I hope I can serve as some inspiration or example how could that look like on the ground. Um, but first things first, let me tell you a little bit about my background. So I 
happened to grow up in a very safe country. I had a very good education. I lived in different places on the globe. I had a good studies. I studied international business and I worked for some of the biggest corporations. I worked in tech and I worked in management consultant. And sports and nature was always a very key part of my life and helped me overcome any challenges I faced. But with age, with time, I also saw more and more the challenges our planet is facing. And I also started to question the role I played in it. And I couldn't help but see that the jobs I held didn't really contribute in helping solving these problems. And I felt I couldn't make the impact I wanted to do. So such as any reasonable person would do, I quit my job and um, I moved to Asia for some time to, with a purpose to really figure out how I could make a meaningful contribution. And living there, I saw firsthand the tremendous negative impact our insatiable consumption and use of toxic and cheap materials has on the people's health and also on our whole planet. And it really brought me to tears, but at the same time, it also really propelled me to action. And that is basically when all the puzzle pieces came together for me. I decided that I want to create a company that puts planet and people first, and that is deeply rooted in responsible consumption. And I call this company an impact first company. So what's the problem then? As I mentioned, I used to do sports my entire life. I basically lived in sports clothes the majority of my waking hours. But with this more aware mindset, I also started looking at the labels of my clothes and I could see that they all consist of synthetics or plastic, mostly polyester or polyamide. And I don't think I need to tell you that most, that the fashion industry is one of the most polluting and climate, contribute, climate change contributing industries in the world. But when it comes particularly to sports clothing and synthetics, there are a couple of key issues related to the environment and our health. So did you know that 70% of all clothes worldwide are made from synthetics, like polyester, which is based on fossil fuel? That 35% of microplastics in the ocean comes from clothing. And that in 2015, 330 million barrels of oil were used to make synthetics. And that synthetics clothes usually include much more toxic chemicals compared to more natural fibers. So what's the solution then? Sorry. Oh, I'm a little bit too fast. Um, so we might easily jump to the conclusion that any natural fiber or recycled versions of plastic or synthetics will solve these issues. But we need to really look at the whole picture. So for example, recycled versions of plastic bottles still release microplastics, still contain fossil fuels, still require a lot of energy to produce and still have these toxic chemicals. And also, if we look at cotton, it requires a lot of pesticide, a lot of water, and bamboo, a lot of chemicals to produce. So what is very important to look at a product, when we want to create a product that truly creates impact, to look at it holistically, to really make sure from start to end, and the whole supply chain really creates an impact, not only in one area, but holistically. Sometimes they could even do worse um, if we just look at one area. So what is our solution? Learning about this issue for me became very clear that I want to create sports clothes that are free from fossil fuel and toxins, that are free from, that don't um, have any, release any waste, that are ethically made and to create a better future for our planet and people. Simply to create sports clothes that is superior to any synthetic product. So I cre created sports clothes that are made from sustainable sourced wood fibers, a renewable resource that is actually a byproduct from the furniture industry. It's produced in a clean and circular process where almost all of the resources are reused over and over again. At the end of the life, they can be composted and go back to soil. They don't include any toxic chemicals and also the manufacturing happens in the EU. They have a high comfort function. They are high quality and durable so that they last for a long time. We also chose timeless and stylish design to ensure that really people will keep on to their clothes for a long time. And eventually also work together with athletes to ensure a great fit and function. So what's our wider impact then? We make nature and people our main stakeholder. So we do that by creating a product 
that really look at the whole supply chain holistically and really from the core we aim to be as sustainable as possible and even from the tiniest detail we make sure we are really putting sustainability and impact first. We are specifically focusing on SDGs 3, 12, 13 and 14, for instance by not using any toxic chemicals, by um, removing microplastic and by making responsible raw material choices. Um, we also avoid harmful substances um, and also what's important to say, we are still producing new products. So we made sure from the very beginning to be climate neutral certified and invest in carbon neutral solutions. So now we have net zero carbon emissions. For each product, we also plant one tree. We also educate and inspire our, our community around clothing and the impact they have on the environment and our health. And then also, of course, by designing products with the user in the center, we make sure they love and keep them for a long time. So what are some of the key factors I found important building tripoles? I think what's really important is, and I said that before, I will say it again, <laughs> is um, to really have a holistic view from start to end when creating a product to really make sure that we don't do harm worse in one area and, and doing maybe okay in another area. I think that is really important to look at the details, to take time uh, and to do that and to really do the impact on all the stages. Um, and of course, many might think this is a very costly endeavor. It won't generate fast growth. And yes, it hasn't been cheap, but I think we have been doing business way too long, ex ignoring key resources like our nature and people. And I think it's really time to change that. And um, also that we need to, and companies need to put a fair price tag on products that also include these key stakeholders. And um, as we know that price has dictates our behavior a lot. And so we know that by charging fair prices, we can make a big impact and also contribute to responsible consumption. And this is basically a new or old way of doing business perhaps to really um, do business with an impact first mindset. Now you might think, are there actually people out there who who will pay the price, who will see the value of such a product? Well, I'm here to tell you that they do. And we have already hundreds of customers who really love our products and our sales numbers are also steadily growing. So just to highlight one quote is here, Tripal's products helped me realize how much better natural fabrics feel in comparison to standard synthetic materials used in most activewear. This makes me especially happy because that's exactly what I wanted to show. I see a lot of people think, well, in order to good, do good sports, we need to have functional plastic uh, clothing. That's our old mindset, but we're here to prove that it can be done in a different, more sustainable way. So what's the way forward? I would be lying to you to tell you that it's an easy journey. It has been far from easy. Um, creating a company in the midst of the corona crisis has been very challenging. Um, and I th for me, it's still a long way to go. A lot of people's minds to be changed for it to have a significant impact on the planet. And I cannot alone achieve the change towards a system that's deeply rooted in business practices that regenerate our planet. So I think what's really important is collaborations, partnerships, and um, a higher awareness on all levels and a commitment. And it requires a paradigm shift to rethink our belief systems and to really start um, doing business in a win-win-win way and the impact first way. So what's the takeaway? Again, I say it again, <laughs> I think it's really important to look at companies when making investment decisions holistically. Also what I think Ben was saying, very, very detailed to make sure that they truly create positive impact on all levels for planet and for people. Um, and then of course for you also to, to support these kind of businesses that really put impact first. And you who are here to coming together here in Geneva, you're yourself and you're representing organizations that have a lot of resources. 
So you can create an immense impact by putting your resources into the right places and can shape the future of our planet. And um, so if I leave you just with one thing, then it would be this. And also, if anyone would ever tell you that it's impossible to create a, comp a profitable company that puts the planet and people first and still is very good for the economies, don't believe them. And now it stops. <laughs> Nothing is impossible until you think it is. So thank you very much. Francesca, thank you so much and congratulations. And uh, I'm a strong believer that sustainability or the outcome focused is a source of innovation, meaning that actually if you focus on the consumers and on new markets, you can create a lot of value. And my question to you is really about partners. Who were the key partners that actually supported you to bring you to where you are today? Really great question, and I could never ever do this alone. Um, and so, like I said, my background is not from the fashion, not from the textile industry. So I started from ground zero in that sense, even though I think my background and my experience helped me to, to do this entrepreneurship journey. Um, but ultimately, it's um, connecting, I, in my case, because of the lack of textile industry knowledge, I went, I reached out to a lot of material fairs and suppliers and sustainable networks, sustainable fabric networks that helped me find materials and such. And then also, you need to look at different angles when doing that. One is the, let's say, expert knowledge, the deep knowledge I need for the materials, for designing, but then it's also running a company requires entrepreneurship and business skills. And so, for me, actually, in Stockholm, we also have an impact hub. So I also connected to other impact entrepreneurs, which helps me a lot to gain perspective, even from other industries, which was an extremely important. And then, um, yeah, having also people that are sitting here in my, in my networks um, helped me tremendously also understand or learning from experience that I didn't have at that time. Um, but it's very important to, to look at these different areas and be proactive. You need to find them. It's all available if we Google it. And you hear a lot of word of mouth, but uh, I cannot do it by hiding myself behind the, or in the room. That won't work. It's refinding really impact connectors to recreating yes. that ecosystem for collaboration exactly. and optionality. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Francisca. This was amazing. So now this was really a concrete case of what impact investment is or impactful business is. So with this, I <laughs> invite from Karen. Karen came all the way from Lucerne. <laughs> She's running an amazing organization also, which she can tell you much more about it. She's bringing the SMEs together and educating the SMEs on, on implementing SDGs. And the organization is called Sunhard Business Leaders. So please. Karen, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to introduce a little the Sunheart Business Leaders, the first Swiss business network for ethical and sustainable small businesses. But before I do that, I would like to ask you one question, just to think about. You don't have to answer now. But what is the really most important thing in your life? The absolutely most important thing. And keep it in your mind when I finish the presentation. I would like to come back to that. So, you might ask, why on earth another network? So, let me try to explain what is different. We know, and we are here because of that, that we have created some huge problems on this planet Earth that we have to solve and we want to solve them. Before a friend of mine and me thought about building uh, another network, we asked ourselves, why on earth do we as intelligent beings do some so stupid things like poisoning the air, poisoning the waters, poisoning the soil, when nature would be here to provide us all with everything that we need through these four elements to be healthy, to live a healthy life on a healthy planet, or what we need to be healed. That's not really intelligent and we ask why. Well, 
Albert Einstein said once, we cannot solve the problems with the same thinking that we used when we created them. And so when we really digged deep enough, we found out that behind all the problems, and I literally say all the problems that we have created on this planet Earth, or in our families, or in our companies, have one root, and it is egocentric thinking or selfishness. And if you go even deeper, you find out that when people have a lot of fear, then they start to think egocentric and they are selfish. And so we knew when we want to build a group with people and entrepreneurs that can really be a force for the good, then we have to start somewhere else. And so we defined five values knowing that when entrepreneurs have a, a resonance to these values or uh, identify with these values, they automatically um, have what it needs to really be part of a, a, a group that can, make, that can make a difference. And so over these values, we attracted just the right people. And I, I didn't went through them because we have only limited time. <laughs> but you saw them. And, and since three years, we attract more and more wonderful people who just say, wow, that's the way I want to run my business. That's the way I want to live on this planet Earth. That, that's the way I want to, to make an impact. And they all have their own business, like Francisca, for example. You have an own business, you have an own impact. And what we want to do with the network is to strengthen these entrepreneurs, their businesses, so that they can continue to do something good and that they can build jobs and expand their business. That was too fast. And we share a vision of a worldwide ethical economy with thriving people serving the common good. How do we do that, concretely? Apart from network opportunities that we offer all our entrepreneurs, we have built or are building a Sunheart community that is a growing community of people who love a lifestyle of health and sustainability because they are looking especially for these companies who offer services and, and products that are produced like yours, for example. And this consumer group is growing. They are called LOHAS. Huh? And when we bring them together, the entrepreneurs and the, the LOHAS, then they find long-term clients and that makes the company more uh, stable. We have a pool, built a pool of experts already. Where do I have to? Uh, experts that support the Sunheart business leaders with their knowledge, with their expertise, whenever they need something, they can come back to them. We are building a, a group of investors who love to get to know these companies and are interested also with, with small amounts sometimes to support them because they know they are doing the, the right thing. And we will build next, next year, start to build a, a marketplace, a platform where the uh, Sunhub business leaders can introduce their products and services so that everybody can find them. That's important. And what we are doing or have already opened is the Sunheart Academy, where the leadership of the future, that's what we call it, this, doing business in harmony with nature is taught. And you need to know if you want to do something that is not against nature, then you need to know first, how does nature work? What are the basic principles of life? What are the laws of nature? How do I have to run a business in accord or in harmony with nature? Then you have a chance to be successful. And that leads automatically to according values and to ethic. And on this ethical foundation, we train them in sustainability and there, especially also in, in circle economy and cradle to cradle because cradle to cradle also looks very much to nature and goes over this, this uh, uh, circular economy thinking. 
And on top of that, we can uh, introduce or, or teach every further business skills that are needed to run a business successfully. But you see, it all starts with values and with, with ethics. And what we intend to do in, in future, as soon as we ourselves find an investor, is that we can build a company alongside to the network where the leaders of the future can practice business in harmony with nature and where they can experience that making profit is a natural effect of doing something good. And this is a new way of thinking. We, we really have to change that. Not the profit comes first, but it shall be a result of, of doing something good. We are proud that we are recognized by the Swiss Confederation as a support to achieve their sustainable goals. And when you ask me how to mainstream impact investment, I would say first and foremost, we need this change in, in our consciousness. We need a new focus from egocentricity to a focus on the common good. And that means automatically from fear to love, because love is the opposite of fear. And I remember times when, when I was told, you cannot talk about love in, in business. And that's absolutely not true. We have to come back to that. We have to have a love, by the way, is the cohesive power in nature. If you withdraw love, you can watch it in your families, there is decay. And it's all in everywhere in nature the same. So we need a new understanding of nature. We need to respect that there is only one planet Earth, only one life, only one big symbiosis, and we are all part of it. We have to take care of each other. We need to know more about the laws of nature that rules everything. We need support also from the financial side, support of according education. And this education shall start in the kindergarten. We do it with our network on the management level. But everywhere you should develop this, this law for nature, this respect and this knowing and this is being astonished. Wow, that's intelligent how you do that. How can we um, do it likewise? And we need a new understanding of success. I would propose new models of rewards, not the one that makes the most profit shall be rewarded, but the one that makes the most positive impact on, on this planet Earth. We need new hiring policies, I would say. I don't know whether you know what the word hierarchy truly means. It is an ancient Greek word from hieros and arche, and means give the power to the holiest people. And whole and holy is very close. And the holiest people is the one that has the whole in the focus and not only the own egocentrical uh, motives. And so we need to put on the top of, of companies, in, on the top in, in politics and wherever, we need to, to uh, put the people who really have this love for the whole and want to do something good for this planet Earth. So to close that, it all comes down to love. Um, my call to action would be really put your love in everything you do and just ask yourself, how would I like to, uh, my, my children to live on this planet? And do whatever you can so that they have a future here in our world. And where there is love, there is no destroying anything. So. This is it. So, so, so Karen, thank you so much. So interesting question would be actually uh, for people to think what they had identified as their priority at the beginning and compare it after the talk of Karen. But yeah. um, first, thank you very much. And I think... May I come back please, to this course, question? Thank you that you remind me. Um, who of you said the most important thing in my life is make money and business? No. Who of you had something in mind that has in the widest sense to do with love? So you know what really is important in life. Huh? So thank you so much, Karen. And uh, yes, I think blind trust, which can be also be, be love, is something we all need and we can build among communities. And uh, 
My, my question is regarding education, because I agree with you. If you want to change behavior, we have to start early. And uh, we are in a stage where a lot of schools, and I see that with my uh, children, are starting to learn very early about entrepreneurship. But of course, the traditional tools, which are innovation, product innovation, finance, and these type of things. And I was wondering, have you considered maybe partnering with some of those actors who are introducing entrepreneurship in schools to bring that complementary dimension that you described to us today? We are open to all possibilities that can be done to really bring the knowledge to, to the people on all levels. And whenever there is a possibility to to make partner to partnering with, with with schools, we would do that, definitely. We just have to go with the flow and to see where opportunities open. But because I put now my investor hat and that would be a very nice way to identify a market, a need, and actually a go to market solution. Anyway, it could be a nice way to frame maybe some of your proposition. Yeah, yeah. I, I just think we have to have this foundation first. And then on top of that, we can put everything else that has to be uh, taught to, make a, to run a good business. But if you miss ethics and values and this love with one word, then we, ha we are lost. We, we won't achieve very much. With the same consciousness, we will create, maybe solve one problem and create another one. And I liked very much what Prince Michael said, responsibility. You do that over years now and decades, and we all have to think like that long term. We have to be responsible for everything that we do, because anyway, it comes back to us, and we see it now, everywhere around us. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Karen, for this. And I just wanted to add that there was a study done, I'll, uh, I'll try to find it, where they found that the basis of all most successful companies has been love. You wouldn't believe it, but even Facebook, the idea behind Facebook was love, to bring people together, to bring friends together. So, so you are very, very near to the truth. So, and, and about the school, I wanted to add that there are already schools where they are teaching chil uh, children from the age of 10, 12, uh, entrepreneurship and sustainable entrepreneurship. So that's already happening. So with this, I invite our last guest of today, uh, Reto Moore. He's from, also from Liechtenstein. He's running a, a fund which is very successful, outperforming the market, and he's doing it quite, quite a long time. So I think Reto can tell you much more about this. Thank Welcome. you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for joining me this morning and uh, really liked your present today, enabling microfinance. Michael was mentioning already, I'm also from Liechtenstein, uh, uh, Impact investing is a long tradition in Liechtenstein already. Uh, I think uh, enabling microfinance is part of it. It was actually, the fund was launched in 2008. At that time, it was uh, exactly after the financial crisis. People were quite a bit uh, scared what is going on now. And uh, a lot of them, a lot of the financial actors, they uh, tried to, uh, yeah, to review. And uh, also in Liechtenstein at the time, uh, all the actors, the associations, uh, the banking sector and uh, the foundation sector were discussing what can we do uh, going forward in terms of new products at that time. And uh, this was all based on a, on a research program at that time at the university in Liechtenstein, assessing whether microfinance is a financial product, is an asset class in general or not. Because at that time, nowadays, it's probably you know already microfinance, it's, it's not mainstream, I would say, but it's, it's more common, people know about it, but at that time was really the first uh, time, and was not really, uh, sorry, was not really uh, at the time of impact investing worldwide. What is microfinance? So uh, we always say financial uh, returns meet social impacts, which is exactly when I need to explain how it is, it is exactly this. Uh, since uh, what we do is we give micro lending to micro entrepreneurs in emerging markets. People that are not included in the financial system, they have uh, skills, they have uh, ideas how to be an entrepreneur, but they have no, no, no assets, they have no uh, money to, to, uh, to do that. And uh, we do this uh, since the beginning of the fund. Uh, so we go in these emerging markets uh, selecting people. We call them active poor. 
the thing is uh, we need to need to explain poverty is 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 worldwide a big topic and uh, when we're talking about microfinance not uh, we want to uh, i mean donation is one good thing donation is very very important these days and was in the past is uh, very important but in some cases it doesn't help you know this is donation is fine but you need to get people helping themselves by setting up a business and uh, s uh, to build up a sustainable livelihood for themselves and their families. And uh, you can see that the performance of the fund is a very stable business. Uh, the performance is very stable. It's non-correlated to other asset classes. And um, I often ask, what is the reason for? I mean, it's so stable. Uh, we don't have uh, default rates at all. There are so many different reasons. One, one of them is, is of course, it's basic, basic business. Oftentimes in the rural areas of the countries, give an example, um, I, I uh, visited the Georgia prior to the COVID crisis. Um, there was a, a, a woman doing some sewing for um, uniforms, for schools, for weddings and so on, and uh, need to buy a sewing machine. So we were actually financing her the sewing machine. Basic things, it's not a, a rocket science. And of course, it's the whole process. So we, we, we coach them, we give them education, we make with them the, the business plans, and this helps to be successful. And, and finally, it's, it's our main target. I mean, if you try to get people from poverty into the financial system, uh, you should first avoid over-indebtedness. And this is the main purpose and the main target we have. So we, we, we really uh, try to and support them all the time during the, 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 the business. Yes, so this is, uh, I would say, the combination impact and, and financial returns. It works and it works well. And something I just for, forgot, the most important point from my point of view is, if you see the people living there in these countries, uh, if you give them just a dollars or, or just a, a donation, this is one thing, but if you give them a perspective, if you give them a, a if you give them a contract on high levels, so we made a contract together, and they have to pay back this money, I think this is to a totally different effect on these people, on their self-esteem, and this is a, a big story, I guess. This is quickly our our history, our milestone. I told you since 2006. Uh, I'm mentioning already uh, the beginning of the fund. The first 10 years was more or less a bit of. Uh, would say a club investing uh, story. It was actually open the fund, but was not uh, open to was not actually distributed. We started that in 2010. The reason for it is we are owned by a charitable foundation. So uh, these are two big foundations in Liechtenstein. One is uh, Hilti Foundation, Hilti Boring Machines. You probably know all of you. Uh, then uh, Medicor Foundations, two foundations, uh, and they saw at the beginning. We don't want to, to make it, we want to, to, to first prove the concept before we go out to, to other investors. So in 2018 was actually the time when uh, the foundation decided to go active in distribution. And in 2020 was another milestone since we uh, got in collaboration with uh, a team called Enabling Capital. They do all the oper operational work for us, the, the portfolio management and the selection of the investments exclusively for us. And this was a big milestone. We can also see that uh, in, in growth of the fund since uh, last year, we've just crossed 100 million in assets. It was exactly one year ago and now uh, by the end of this month, we are about 300 million. So uh, the demand and, and the interesting in the market is, is really huge. And this is uh, good news. Yes. Another topic or another unique uh, position of EMF is the fund is one thing, but uh, it was from the beginning pretty clear from the foundation side that they don't want just um, do the fund, they want to support the whole cycle. The whole cycle means, I mentioned already, it's not for anyone. Microfinance does address so-called active poor with all the knowledge and they, they are really uh, uh, prepared for applying a loan. But there's so many other people around that don't have the skills. And uh, our foundation is doing, this is on point two, is doing some education programs with the purpose to get all these people around uh, 
have the possibility to apply for a micro loan. And we do some different programs. For example, uh, two years ago, we started one in uh, Kenya and Cameroon. We educated uh, women with uh, training programs, how to make a business plan and so on. And it was really funny since uh, the foundation was expecting at least out of uh, 200 women, uh, around 30 will start a new business. And that was not uh, the case at least, it was only nine at least. But uh, it was quite a good experience since uh, the nine, they were really, really prepared to, to start and the other ones are just working about to, to get these skills. Since it's very important that they know how to, uh, since at least it's, it, it's a loan, since a loan needs to be paid back and this is the most important part. It's just finally how it works. I mean, this is a very complex uh, uh, process. So uh, I often ask if we uh, lend directly to micro-entrepreneurs as a fund, that's not possible. We do work with so-called uh, microfinance institutions, intermediaries, they select the, the, the micro-entrepreneurs. So we give actually, we take the, uh, the, the funds from our investors. These are mainly uh, family offices, banks, uh, but also pension funds these days are quite interested in investing in, in, in microfinance, NGOs, institutions, institutional clients, they invest in the fund and we do actually select microfinance, entrepreneur, uh, microfinance institutions. These are small banks in the region uh, doing this kind of business, selecting the micro entrepreneurs and actually supporting them with uh, so-called loan officers. So this is how it works. We currently have in our portfolio, just to give you an idea, over 80 MFIs. We, have, uh, we are invested in uh, 32 countries in emerging markets and we have currently 122 outstanding loans. And uh, to underpin the impact on that, uh, currently we are reaching over 270,000 people with our investments, people who can actually uh, build up a, a livelihood uh, for themselves and their families. One key, or one thing is also to mention, uh, it's, it's a women business, female business. This is uh, over 50%, exactly 54% currently are women. So uh, this is also quite too, too, too important to know since uh, women are, in these countries, women are taking, making the business and, and, and uh, doing the, all the bookkeepings and so on. And, and the men's are usually work for this. So, I'm finished. I'm open for questions. <laughs> Th thank you very much. And I think uh, Geneva is also a center of microfinance. Yes, of course. Years. And it would be interesting to see actually how you differentiate yourself. But my question is more about the future. And we've spoken about technology. And of course, technology could be a great platform let's say, to access directly some of those micro entrepreneurs. And I was wondering, is it maybe a dimension you'll be considering the future? And if you have maybe yes. some examples? Or yes, it's a very important, uh, technology is very important. It, it helps actually, since the process I just outlined at last, it is this, this, uh, this uh, value chain, so microfinance value chain is quite complex. Contracts, uh, it takes time that, since the investor is investing in the fund and finally reached by the micro entrepreneurs, there's a lot of technology involved, and this helps. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's, why it is so successful? I think it's still a people business. Because uh, I've, I've been in Georgia, I mentioned it already, and, and uh, the loan officer from the microfinance institutions, they are so close to these entrepreneurs, and I think that makes it also so successful since they discussing daily business, they are just a, a sparing partner of them, and this you cannot uh, uh, do with technology. So, But it helps, of course, to a certain point, but it's not at least uh, it's still a people business. I, I totally agree and I think that's definitely one key message not only for our discussion but maybe also for the Building Bridges week is at the end people, trust mm. and connectivity and generosity I think in ideas, projects, opportunities is really what will make actually uh, our initiatives go forward, accelerate and meet our 2030 or even 50 goals depending actually what angle you look at. But Thank you so much, Reto. Thank you. So thank you, Reto, very, very much. Uh, with this, I think we open the floor to the 
question answer for everybody. If you, anybody has any questions or something, please put it forward. And if you can maybe just present yourself. Thank you very much. Hello. I'm a professor of finance, so I'm more on the <coughs> other side of impact investing, which recently interests me. So I have a question to Franziska, but uh, basically the same question to Rete. So first of all, I think it's really fantastic what you're doing, and I really want to buy this fashion for my next exercise. I hope there's better ways than Amazon Prime buses to get it, but anyway. So, um, <clears throat> so my question is, do you have any idea in terms of the environmental impact of the problem that you are solving, right? So, or helping to solve. So how big the problem is. Or in other words, I mean, let's say you take over all the fashion industry, what you take over, Adidas, Nike, Essex, and so forth, or they all follow your way to produce. I mean, uh, what would, uh, could you quantify the, environmental, the positive environmental impact it would have? I mean, I also understand there's you know, positive health impacts and so forth for customers, but in terms of the environmental impact, are you able to quantify this? Because I think it would also, let's say, be a strong uh, selling argument if you could, right? So, and uh, in the same way, the question to Rita would be, I mean, how do you actually measure this, the impact of your microfinance activities? I understand the fund is profitable, but in terms of, let's say, the, the impact it creates, I mean, do you monitor this and how do you do this? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a really, really good question and it's good that you ask that. Um, I think, you know, the impact, I actually thought a lot about it, and there are many different components when it comes to the environment. You have the microplastic issue, which I talked about. You have the fossil fuel that a lot of conventional plastic or synthetics use. And um, then, of course, the chemicals. And so, if you look at what I aim to achieve, and if I want to quantify the impact, well, first of all, by not using or not being dependent on fossil fuel, the whole impact that fossil fuel has through materials falls away, or the negative impact. Um, if you look at microplastic, that is very interesting. I, I studied that. There is a good amount of data that shows that only one wash of synthetic clothing, such as polyester, releases 700,000 microplastics. And now think about, this is just a one-off wash, and now think about, you know, the impact, or first of all, sports clothes are usually washed very often compared to usual clothes. And then you can make the math, you know, households, how many washes they do, two to three washes in a week on average. And then you can quantify the microplastic pollution versus the elimination of that. Um, and then, of course, our raw material is the forest. And I said also very clearly, and also here, we need to be very careful because I don't want to speak too long about this, um, but there are other materials such as viscose that also take the forest. But it's different kind of um, uh, raw material choices, not necessarily from certified forests. There might be danger cutting off some places in the rainforest. So that's why I kept on saying we need to be very detailed. But then again, um, your question was, you know, how to, what if everybody would change to that? Well, my hope is that, can, that I can, like a domino effect, that others will follow suit. But if you think, of course, of all the population in the world, can we all do that? And what would be the impact? Would that perhaps become negative? Of course, we need to really take this step by step. My, like, I don't stop here. I really think, how could this serve more people? And how could it be, perhaps, be recycled or there are other business models or complementary, such as reuse, um, repurpose, that could also be very interesting, so that you don't have to take all the raw material, even though it's renewable. Um, but yeah, so the short answer is really, the microplastic pollution is very quantifiable because there is already good research on plastic now. Um, the elimination of fossil fuel, I think, by not using that is positive. And then also what I said that is not directly linked to the product, but for me it was important since we are producing new products that we're immediately climate neutral certified. So we also always invest. So now right now we're in net zero carbon emissions. So the small emissions we have right now, we compensate 
And on top of that, we also plant a tree in regions that matter the most. So you could also quantify the regions in the Amazon or so that obviously help to sequester carbon and then help to make more better soils and uh, clean up our planet. So um, I hope that could give you some, some answer at least. Thank you. My question was about the impact, I guess. Uh, we do actually, we have an impact report. We announced that uh, on a yearly basis, which can be seen on, on our homepage. Uh, impact is, uh, to, to measure the impact is quite an important topic and uh, uh, to quantify it, it's, it's sometimes a bit difficult, but what we do is, uh, of course I mentioned already, I mentioned it, uh, we are currently reaching 270,000 people with our portfolio and we have our case studies to see how they get out of poverty in terms of how they build up the business, this is one thing. We do actually uh, contribute to 14 out of these 17 SDGs. Uh, this is also written in the import. This is quite important for us. So these are, I mean, quantifying is, is, is not always easy, but uh, in combination uh, to, 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 to see how the people, and, and a lot of case studies, you know, to understand how the business works, I think this should be at least uh, give, uh, yeah, the, the trust in, in the business. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, for this super inspiring panel. I, I really f leave the room with a lot of inspiring thoughts. I work at Roach. I work in enabling access to healthcare ecosystems. And my question about microfinancing, because this is something we, we are looking at at the moment, is what in your data has been the default rate accumulative default rate of, of the loans that you, you grant to these people. And then the follow-up question to that will be, um, are these credit lines, these loans that you grant to these communities subjected to entrepreneurship pro projects or are they able to finance, for example, healthcare? catastrophes with this, as long as they can prove that they can pay back? First question is, uh, I think, I'm not quite sure, but we have actually dispersed since the, 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 the launch of the fund over 2,000 loans, and only nine of them have been not fully paid back. So this is a, and the default rate is not all, only our fund, in, in the industry in general is below 1%. So the default rate, and so I try to explain some reasons for, I think uh, one of the key reasons, it's myself, it's not uh, written in a book or something, it's like this, and this is what exactly what, what Derek mentioned, is that these people, self-esteem, they have the last chance, they have no other options, and now they have a chance to, to build up a business. I think this, yeah, this, um, this energy, I think this is uh, one of the key, in my point of view, one of the key factor. Secondly, what we do, uh, Yes, of course. I mean, what we do in our fund, we do only uh, invest in, in, in so-called micro-entrepreneurs and SME, small and media, medium enterprises. So when they uh, build up a business, I'll give you an example with that uh, example in Georgia, sewing machine, making uh, clothes for um, schools and so on. She started alone and within or one or two uh, years, now she has uh, more than five or six employees. So she needs to buy new ones and so on. So it gets more to a small and medium enterprises business. Uh, it's mainly our focus now is on, on basic things. Uh, this is more in the, in the food chain, agro chain, ag agriculture chain. And this is more or less our focus in our fund. So um, uh, we do not, uh, of course, sometimes other businesses, but it's not. Uh, it's, it's more or less uh, most of the, uh, more more than fifty percent is food related. Sorry, so they, they didn't catch it. Why is the default rate is so low? Yeah. Why is so hard to pay? Why is it so low? I just try to explain. I mean, <laughs> I think it's it's basically a combination of different things. I mean, as mentioned, these uh, the time when you apply for a loan, you need to be 
prepared for that. So they need to be skilled. It's going to be that uh, second, you need to be uh, supported, you need to be um, uh, trained. Uh, so uh, the business plan, you need to check. Also in these rural areas, sometimes it's, it's not that difficult to, in these basic things, to, uh, to make uh, an expectations of the, of the cash flows. Since you know people need there, they need food, they need this, and, and you, you can actually, it's quite visible, you know. This is another point. So it's, it's a few different factors, uh, at least, but it's a close relationship. I think this is the most important thing, close relationship with the micro-entrepreneurs. And, and, the, and, and the social engagement, you know, you need to be close to them. And we don't want to, at least uh, if it doesn't work, it doesn't need to pay back anything. I mean, uh, at least if it's not, if the business doesn't work, then we don't, uh, yeah, they are still poor and we don't want to put them in over deadness. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I, I'll just use my privilege as a moderator to ask two questions. First, uh, Karin, why are you only in the German part? Are you thinking also about <laughs> this, the, the, the French part, like Geneva? And, and second question, I'll go to uh, Prince Michael. So I, I know that Liechtenstein is quite a role model, it's perfect, it's, but it's still a very small country. But, and, and, and I also know that family businesses or businesses which has the families behind it, they think of long term, they think of the values, there it works. But what about the MNCs where you have the, the goal of the management team is to get the end of the year's bonus? That is, I think, where the damages link portion and that is, I think, where we need the regulations to, to at least control or try to put them on one path. And, and maybe another point to that is the, uh, the, the inclusion of the prices of the external, externalities, because a lot of the products, a lot of the things do not have the external prices in it. And that's why somehow the market economy is not working in the case of environment. Shall I start? <laughs> okay. um, yeah, we have a, a vision, as you saw, of a worldwide ethical economy with thriving people serving the common good. And, and in fact, we, we are mainly in, in the German-speaking part of Switzerland, but we have already in three different countries of Europe members. And we are very uh, interested to, to expand. We just need to, to find the people and, and to start there with an own group, maybe, that has to be organized then. But it will come, definitely. So you guys all heard it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you, you had, you had an, a number of, of questions, but first, uh, I tell you, in family businesses, also for the management, if the family they, they takes care of that, the end of the year figures is not the most important thing. It is important because, you know, you have to control it, you have to see whether you reach a target. But it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a long-term goal. Um, we have, and I'm coming back to something where, which, which uh, you have said, this question of love, trust, responsibility on one side and fear on the other side. There is much less fear in family companies. There is love. The fear I see mostly in politics. I see in the uh, airways regulators. They are terrified the whole time. <laughs> and and in, in the large public companies. But we must not overtake it. The large public companies is not the bulk of the business of a country. This is, you see the DAX companies in Germany, they make less than 1% of the German GDP. So it's, uh, the, the, we, we, we have to see that. And I think, for instance, Francisca, she didn't have fear. And, the, and uh, she, must have, she might have had concern, maybe she slept sometimes, but, but, she, but she didn't have fear, she, she, she was interested. So, and I don't think, uh, I think if you want to be successful in business, you should not regulate how you remunerate the people. Because then there is a standard set of people who have no idea what happened in, in, the, in the different uh, companies. And I think the problems we have, we are the more public controlled companies. They are the state-owned companies or the big public companies. So I, I don't see a role of regulators in that. You asked me another question, and I forgot about that. No, no, this, this was mainly that the, without the regulators, how can the, you bring this, uh, this, this, this and the was, price of the external? Yeah, and, and you know the, the, the price of the 
except that you, you have to, to look at your, let's say, your supply on, on all this external things. But there, again, it comes into responsibility, the, 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 the long-term view of that. You have an idea, you, 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 you want to carry that through. I think it's very good that now it's coming, and there, I think there, the NGOs play a quite a good role that there's an awareness. Problem is that NGOs like to get radical. Mm -hmm. and, and then they always think that they are, or, or, or they are, that, that, that they are very right. But I think it, it is good that this awareness came up that, that, we, that, we, have to, that we have to do something. And external, uh, externally, you ask, um, why are you not in, um, not me, but neighbor, why are you just in the German-speaking part of Switzerland? You can only do as much as, as, as you can. And I think, but, but, but you give an example, and there might be followers. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think, I think leadership is key. And what has been fascinating today, I think, is your diversity of experience, expertise, and also how close you are to providing solutions or vision. And I think that has been, for me, actually a key, key learning. And maybe to rebound on, on SIA, I think what SIA aims to do is also bring that diversity in the world of impact, to really connect people. And as we look at nature, biodiversity strengthens systems. And we're strong believers that actually through a strong, diverse ecosystems of impact, we can actually uh, accelerate our response. And we hope that actually here in Swiss Romandie, with Zug and international actors that actually SIA has built over the years, we'll be able to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Time went so fast. I was <laughs> worried, how are we going to cover the 90 minutes? We are 100 minutes. Thank you very much, and you're all welcome. If you want to have any information, anything, you can contact us, or you can find all information of SIA on the website. So Thank, with you this Thank you very much. Thank you.